Hello everyone, welcome to Biomechanics class. Now we will discuss about lumbar vertebral spine. Let us brush up the basic anatomy of the lumbar spine in brief. There are five lumbar vertebra L1 to L5 with anterior curve being convex and posterior curve being concave. So the normal curvature of the lumbar vertebral spine is lordotic in posture. In between these lumbar vertebras, there is a presence of fibrocartilaginous disc which is called as intervertebral disc. This intervertebral disc along with the lumbar vertebral spine transmits the weight from the upper body to the pelvis and lower limb. So therefore the size of the lumbar vertebral body is the largest among all the vertebral spine. There are four typical lumbar vertebra and one atypical lumbar vertebra. L1 to L4 is the typical lumbar vertebra whereas L5 is the atypical lumbar vertebra. So we won't go much into detail of the anatomy of lumbar vertebral spine. We will focus on this alignment of the facet joint for lumbar vertebral spine. As you can see in the picture the alignment of the facet joint is nearly 90 degree to the horizontal plane. And also the orientation of the facet joint is more in sagittal plane compared to thoracic and cervical facet joint orientation. We learned that in cervical facet joint, the orientation was around 45 degree to the horizontal plane. In thoracic vertebral spine, we learned that the angle of the facet joint was around 60 degree to the horizontal plane. Whereas in lumbar spine, it is nearly 90 degree. Therefore, the orientation of the facet joint is more sagittal and it is 90 degree to the horizontal plane. There is less chance of rotation at the lumbar vertebral spine compared to thoracic and cervical vertebral spine. While mentioning the osteokinematics, we have to remember three points that is motion, that is motion occurring at the joint planes at which the motion occurs, planes and axes at which the motion occurs and range of motion. So motion occurring at the lumbar vertebral spine are flexion, extension, side flexion and rotation. Flexion and extension occurs in sagittal plane and coronal axis. Lateral flexion occurs in frontal plane and sagittal axis and rotation occurs in transverse plane or horizontal plane and vertical axis. The range of motion for forward flexion is approximately 0 to 40 to 60 degree. The range may differ because of the age, gender or flexibility of the body. So the athletes will have more range compared to sedentary person. Extension range is from 0 to 20 degree to 35 degree. Rotation is very less in lumbar vertebral spine compared to the thoracic and cervical vertebral spine. As we have already discussed in the anatomy, the facet alignment of the lumbar vertebral spine is nearly 90 degree to the horizontal plane and also it is facing to each other more in sagittal plane. Therefore, rotation will be less compared to other vertebral spine. Side flexion is from 0 to 15 degree to 20 degree. So the maximum range that is available at the lumbar vertebral spine is forward flexion and the minimum range is the rotation. Now coming to arthrokinematics, during flexion the inferior articulating facet of the superior vertebra that is L1 for this picture L1 is the superior vertebra and L2 is the inferior vertebra. So during flexion, the inferior articulating facet of the superior vertebra will slide superiorly and slightly anteriorly on the superior articulating facet of the inferior vertebra. So this is quite similar to thoracic and lumbar vertebra sliding of the facets, which is the main source of movement that occurs in the vertebral spine or vertebral column. During extension, this inferior articulating facet of the superior vertebra will slide inferiorly on the superior articulating facet of inferior vertebra. During lateral flexion, for example, lateral flexion to the right, 
on the same side the inferior articling facet of the superior vertebra will slide inferiorly on the superior articulating facet of the inferior vertebra and on the opposite side the inferior articulating facet of the superior vertebra will slide superiorly on the superior articulating facet of the inferior vertebra so you can already imagine that the intertransverse ligament is going to limit this side flexion which we have discussed previously in thoracic spine and the cervical spine now for rotation as we have discussed that the facet orientation is nearly 90 degree with the horizontal plane and it is facing sagittally therefore there will be less rotation but still there is slight amount of rotation of 0 to 3 to 18 degree so let's imagine the vertebral spine is rotating to the right side on the same side the inferior articulating facet will slide posteriorly on the superior articulating facet of the inferior vertebra on the opposite side the inferior articulating facet of the superior vertebra will slide slightly anteriorly on the superior articulating facet of the inferior vertebra so this sliding will create approximately 0 to 3 degree or 0 to 18 degree of rotation at the lumbar vertebral column which is the combination of movement or sliding of the faces from L1 to L5. Now let us discuss about the lumbopelvic rhythm which is an important topic. So what is lumbopelvic rhythm? It is the relationship of lumbar movement, hip movement and tilting of the pelvis in the sagittal plane which is during forward bending and backward bending of the lumbar spine along with the hip joint now let us discuss about the first section of the lumbar pelvic rhythm we will be talking about the movement of pelvic bone if the pelvic bone tilts anteriorly it is called as anterior pelvic tilt if the pelvic bone rotates posteriorly it is called as posterior pelvic tilt anterior pelvic tilt can be created by contraction of the iliopsoas and rectus femoris muscle as well as erector spinae muscle posterior pelvic tilt can be created voluntarily by contraction of gluteus maximus hamstring muscle and rectus abdominis muscle abnormally anterior tilt posture can be present in patient because of the tightness of iliopsoas and rectus and tightness of the extensor muscles of the lumbar that is erector spinae there could also be weakness of the Abdominal muscles that is flexor of the lumbar spine which are rectus abdominis internal and external oblique muscles as well as weakness of the gluteus group of muscles which are hip extensors. So let us draw a line from the tightness to tightness and weakness to weakness muscle and there is a cross. So this cross is called as lower cross syndrome where the extensors of the lumbar vertebra and the flexor of the hip are tight whereas there is weakness of abdominal muscles and weakness of the gluteal muscle this posture can be corrected by strengthening the abdominal muscles and the gluteus muscle and stretching the hip flexors and lumbar extensors abnormal posterior tilt posture may be present because of the contracture of the rectus abdominis muscle and tightness of the hamstring and gluteal muscle whereas there will be weakness of hip flexors and lumbar extensors so let us draw a line again from weakness to weakness and tightness to tightness and we will see a lower cross syndrome which is posterior tilt lower cross syndrome however anterior tilt lower cross syndrome is more common let us discuss the next section of the lumbo pelvic rhythm that is nutation and counter nutation. Nutation and counter nutation of the sacrum is in relation to the movement of pelvic bone. When there is a posterior tilt of the pelvic, there is anterior tilt of the sacrum which is called as nutation. When there is anterior tilt of the pelvic, there is a posterior tilt of the sacrum which is called as counter nutation. It is a very minimal movement approximately. 1 to 2 millimeter of translatory movement and 0 to 4 degree of rotatory movement while weight bearing 
there is nutation which causes compression of the SI joint thereby improving the stability of the SI joint. While non-weight bearing or during sitting posture there will be counter nutation of the sacrum because of which the SI joint will be less stable and the weight will be the body weight will be bared by lumbar vertebral column. Here we will discuss the third section of the lumbopelvic rhythm. The total lumbopelvic rhythm range will be brought about by the flexion at the lumbar vertebra, flexion at the hip joint and anterior pelvic tilt. If there is reduction in the flexion range of the hip joint, it could be because of the stiffness of the hip joint or tightness of the hamstring muscles. In this condition, the lumbar spine will take more stress to compensate the loss in lumbopelvic rhythm or loss in the range of lumbopelvic rhythm. So when the lumbar spine tries to compensate the range by flexing more, it will create more stress on the posterior tissues of the lumbar spine, exposing it to injury. So therefore, the posterior structures of the lumbar spine will be more prone for injury if the hip flexion is compromised. In case of stiffness of the lumbar vertebral spine, the hip joint has to increase the range of motion to compensate the loss in lumbopelvic range due to which there may be undue stretch of the hamstring and it may be more prone for injury. Therefore, regular training and maintaining the flexibility of the lumbar spine length of the muscles by stretching can reduce the chance of injury at the low back and the hip joint area. So strengthening of the core muscles which are rectus abdominis, internal and external oblique, stretching and strengthening of the lumbar extensors muscle that is erector spinae, strengthening of the gluteus maximus, stretching of the hamstring and iliopsoas as well as rectus femoris will maintain the normal lumbopelvic rhythm and reducing the chance of injuries.